joined. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so uh, thank you all for um, coming along to this um, PTIC meeting. Um, it's good to see you all and uh, and talk to you. Um, so unfortunately, we can't be with uh, CPT. Um, we we are we are thinking about the hospitality of CPT and their uh, their lunches, which are rather good. So uh, yes, <laughs> um, we've um, we've got um, a fairly full um, agenda. Um, I've got apologies from Justin Bloom from VIX, um, who can't be uh, with us today. Um, he um, is very um, interested in some of the discussions, and so he asked whether um, we could record um, the session uh, and make it available afterwards. Um, so I don't know whether anybody's got any problems with that. Um, I'll take silence as um, acceptance then. Okay. Um, so um, if we take a quick go through the minutes of the previous meetings, because there's some things that um, will play I suspect into uh, bus open data um, and uh, and the things that Mira um, might want to uh, to talk about um, so um, 11th of February not long before uh, we were all um, confined to uh, to working from home and uh, not being able to travel in Preston um, was the last physical meeting um these have been done the rounds a number of times and um teresa's um hopefully picked up um anything that uh, that you've raised as incorrect and things like that already but if there is anything shout up as we go through um and uh, um Item one, BOD's guidance. There was some feedback for the department, which um, I think they've dealt with in terms of clarity about number of services to be supported. Um, I think the um, key thing is to just keep um, getting the message out there and talking to as many people as possible about BODs. Um, under item two, um, the actions, um, that's, I suspect, stuff that Mira will pick up about um, coordination with authorities um, and operators and suppliers. Um, Item three, um, that was encouraging people to use it and to feedback things. Um, and at that point, there were still some business change workshops uh, planned. Um, then item four, um, update on using BODs. It was very BODs heavy, the last one. Um, first action about an FAQ site. Um, that's something that we might want to um, pick up when we uh, come on to work website later on. Um, otherwise, um, TFN update on fares. Uh, we've got Richard joining us late. Uh, Richard's joined, so he can update us on that. Um, a correction to the minutes, which is done. Um, Siri SX profile. Um, I think that's probably one for Richard.
lectured about local authority advice. Um, and then I've had a few more bits of interest about the opera project, which is good. Uh, and that's that one. Um, then we had a special meeting looking at the trans exchange profile that um, um, Stuart had produced. That's a point, Teresa. We've got apologies from Stuart if you'd not picked those up. Um, so um, there's only a couple of actions which sit with um, Stuart on that and then um, asking about um, how it's going to be promoted and, and different document versions um, which um, Stuart I believe has fed back to the DFT already from a conversation I had with him um, and um, I suspect Mira will pick up on implementation groups and, and, and updates about progress on BODs. So that's the minutes and actions. Um, first up, we've got um, Mira. I think we'll swap things around Mira for, to do BODs first and then the COVID-19 measures. Is that the right way around for you? Mira, hello. You're on mute at the moment. Sorry, um, just switching camera back on and um, yeah, that's the right way around. And um, we've got updates on those. Right, camera's back on. Um, do you want me to start now? Yeah, please. Yeah. So, update on bods. Okay. Um, right, I'm just going to share my screen. Check everyone can see. So, I've just put together a short progress update on bods and where we are at the moment. Can everyone see that? Yep. Yeah, okay, perfect. Right, just look at me. Okay, that's great. Um, okay, um, so I'll just give you a short whistle stop tour of where we're up to with um, Bus Open Data Program as it stands. Um, I suppose some of the key successes um, since I, I'm trying to actually remember the last time we would have come to BTEC, but um, some of the key successes have been um, we've launched the timetables um, find and publish service back in um, January 2020 and so that's now in its public beta um, and we've been supporting the big five to publish their data sets and then also some of the medium sized operators have made really good progress as well um, and have worked with partners such as Passenger and Ticketer to, to get um, their trans exchange files onto pods. Um, so we've got three of the big five operators on there, Stagecoach, Go Ahead and Arriva. Um, we're just working through a couple of uh, minor issues um, with each of their national data sets, and so there's a couple of small anomalies, um, and then also working with Birth to get their data on there. A National Express will follow um, around the autumn time, and they're just um, experiencing some challenges with staff being furloughed. Um, so uh, generally, we've, um, we feel like we've made quite a lot of progress in terms of the publication of timetables data, but it is a public beta service, and so I think it is worth making the point that there's, there's still work to do on the service, there's even issues that we're working through um, to make sure that the, the, the data publication process is as streamlined and straightforward as possible for operators. Um, and I think also actually we've started to receive some really good feedback from data consumers as well, um, who are just sharing some of their insights about how the, the service could be optimised to support things like matching and help them match timetables to location data. Um, so that's really, uh, yeah, essentially quite helpful. Um, 
the funds exchange profile, um, so Stuart Reynolds did um, a, a really um, helpful constructive piece of work um, last year on a trans exchange 2.4 bus open data profile. That has now been completed. The technical documentation has also been completed, and we've been socialising that with the industry. And for any of you who received it, the monthly progress updates that I send around, um, the profile was attached out, and I've sent it to the technology suppliers. And um, meetings, um, so I've had a couple of meetings today. I've got a couple of meetings coming up, and um, with different technology suppliers and. Um, Omnibus are already working on their export and validator for the new 2.4 profile, so we're quite reassured that the majority of the industry will be well served, um, but also um, talking with Trippies and Optibus as well about their plans to integrate um, the new Trans Exchange Bods 2.4 profile with their existing products and services. Um, it is worth making the point that the current profile um, the, 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 the new BODS profile is not a significant departure from um, previous profiles or versions of Trans Exchange. What Stuart has sought to do in the new profile is um, address some of the, um, some of the, the um, most common issues. Um, also of note is um, the test site for the publication of location data has now been launched. Um, so that's been a run. And actually, I put nine operators publishing data. I found out today that we're actually at 10. Um, so we just had one more sign up earlier today. Um, so we've got 10 operators publishing their data onto the test site. And, and as I said, the data consumers were just, we started to invite data consumers to, to work with the test site last week. And that, that's what's really prompted some of that quite helpful feedback about how to optimise the, the design of BODS to support the, the matching of timetables and location data. So I say, I think that's really helpful. And um, the team have been working on the development of the Siri VM profile. We've been socialising that with um, the operators, with technology suppliers, with data consumers, who have all actually been involved in shaping the profile. Um, and obviously, a um, huge thanks goes to Tim as well, who's had you know, a, quite a significant role to play in the development of the Siri VM profile. Um, the team are just working up the technical documentation, and again, we'll work with Tim and also to, to finalise that. Um, but the, the Siri VM profile is, um, it contains um, a, a broad range of um, mandatory fields, some of which will support things like matching, um, and then also considering how we include some optional fields, in particular, you know, what we've really seen during COVID-19 is we've seen a lot of the ETM suppliers really step up and make modifications to their ETMs to be able to capture additional data in real time through the feeds um, to, to, to enable essentially a volumetric count. Of, um, so, so, so enabling us to tell passengers through apps, products and services. Um, how many people are on the bu on the bus at any one time? And you know, in a world at the moment where we're trying to step up and, and, and service provision back to 100% by the end of the month, early July. But actually, even when you've got 100% services running, only 20% of the capacity will exist with current social distancing arrangements and the two meter rule. And it'll only ever change to about 30% if you get it, even if you reduce it to one meter. It's really important that passengers know um, at the, the levels of occupancy on the vehicles um, and can then make informed decisions about when to travel and how to travel and disperse effectively um, because we, you know, we, we really want to avoid scenarios where you've got people queuing at bus stops. Um, so that data, so COVID has in a lot of ways highlighted um, some of the fragilities of existing approaches and then actually really enabled the industry to step up and solve those problems. We've been really impressed with the ETM suppliers and um, Ticketer, Fix and Dinner have all um, implemented solutions now or, or, or are currently implementing solutions um, and we actually believe that that data will be just invaluable to BODS um, going forward and so we'll look to accommodate the, the optional fields in the, in the Siri VM profile. Um, other things of note, um, so Nat Town Improvements projects underway. Um, one of the team are working actively with local authorities across England to um, essentially provide um, updated Nat Town data sets for the local authority area. The updates are based on an algorithm that identifies some of the most common errors in Nat Town data currently. We estimate the error rate to 4% on average, but it really varies by geography. Um, and so in some areas, you know, you can see a 10% error rate. 
Um, so we think, and, and, and as I'm sure many of you appreciate in this group, um, NAPTAM really is the glue that holds together lots of different data sets. I'm um, sorry, I'm, I'm stealing um, Judy Williams' quote there. Um, but it, it, you know, it's fundamentally important in being able to tie together some, some of the different data sets that we want to make openly available through BODS and driving data consumption. So it's really important that NAPTAN is correct. Um, so um, we've got one team working on that. Um, so 17 authorities have received updated NAPTAN data set. Six of them have uploaded. And one of the calls to action is, is if you're a, a, from a local authority and you um, have received an updated NAPTAN data set but you haven't yet sampled it or, or uploaded it, please do. Um, and if you haven't yet received an updated NAPTAN data set, please do get in touch with us and um, we'll be more than happy to help you. Um, other things of note are, um, so we've just let um, some extensions to the BODS um, contract and so um, essentially we'll also be providing as part of BODS a reporting and analytics platform and that will be really invaluable in, in ensuring that we can optimise usage of data so it will enable um, operators and local authorities and the department including DBSA and the OTC to um, monitor the health of location data feeds, for example, so, so we can see um, which vehicles are providing location data feeds, um, whether the feeds have gone down, are they being provided to the required update frequency, et cetera. Um, also, as part of that, we'll be able to um, provide a punctuality reporting service, and that will be useful for both operators who will need to provide punctuality reports as, part, uh, as, a, as a statutory requirement from the 1st of March 2021, but also it will support the um, DBSA and OTC to digitally transform some of their activities because at the moment the DBSA examiners um, you know, invest a huge amount of time and resource completing punctuality monitoring in a largely quite manual and paper-based way, standing at bus stops and counting the number of buses that are arriving early, late or on time um, for operators that are under investigation. And so yeah, we do think it's really important that DBSA are given the tools that they need to digitally transform and that, that's where um, this will also become useful. Um, but also local authorities will be able to um, dig into that reporting and analytics platform um, to help um, them essentially understand punctuality issues across the network, um, assess congestion and identify pinch points and then participate actively and proactively in, in, in punctuality partnerships. And um, so we think that's great news. Um, and also as part of the extensions, it's worth noting as well that the data that we're providing through BODS will be provided to data consumers in GTFS and GTFS RT formats. And we've known for quite some time um, through consultation and through regular engagement with the operator, um, so with the data consumers, that GTFS and GTFS RT are their, their preferred data formats, but we aren't in a position to mandate the provision of data from operators in those formats because really the legal mandate for operators needs to work with, um, it needs to be something that can be implemented and is, is feasible for the operators fundamentally. Um, so we think that's good news for the data consumers and in particular realising benefits from BODS. Um, and then finally, um, so the SI was laid in Parliament on the 13th of May um, 2020, so just last month. And um, we had the first of two debates on um, just this Tuesday gone. Um, Rachel McLean led that. She is Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for the Department, also Minister for the Future of Transport. And you know, this generally isn't her brief, um, but she 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 was the Commons Minister leading the debate and did you know really amazing job actually. Um, landed some really important points that we were very keen to make around um, the, really the, the value of investing in the public transport information offer and, and the benefits we've seen in London initially but also more recently in the West Midlands as well um, and the levels of, of patronage growth that we've seen in areas that have really understood that if you give passengers the right information, they will use your products and services. They they, they will use bus, bus services, and that you know is a is a method that that's essentially what's at the heart of BODS here. Um, so that went really well. The opposition, um, the the, the buses um, opposition minister was briefed on the Monday, and 
I gen generally felt it was a really good um, policy, couldn't see any reason why they would oppose it, um, and felt that this was delivering good things for passengers, so, so we were really happy with that. And that was largely echoed in, in, in the chamber um, you know, from the beginning. They set the stall and said they didn't see the need for a vote. Um, but did ask some interesting questions about um, competition impacts and then also went into a broader discussion around bus services and, and um, bus funding. Um, we've got the final debate later this month and um, that will be led by Baroness Beer and she is um, very comfortable with the bus open data brief and um, so we've got no doubt that she will be you know, absolutely fantastic and and then beyond that um, we'd expect um, probably in mid to late July and um, the regulations will be made usually about two to three weeks after the debate um, the regulations will be made and then they'll be commenced at the common commencement date in the autumn time um, and that will put us on track to uh, for the requirements to 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 uh, take effect from the end of the year um, so then just in terms of some of the challenges as well um, so there have been some challenges um, to, to, to be perfectly candid um, and so the probably one of the main challenges has been you know COVID-19 and um, you know, as I'm sure all of you in, in, in this forum will understand brought lots of resource challenges and, and different challenges for, for different organisations and teams and that includes my team who have you know, been instructed by Baroness Beer to continue with bus open data, which is identified as one of her top priorities. Um, but then also we've had COVID-19 work to deal with as well. So, it was, so you know, we've had at least 30% extra workload on. Um, I think everyone's probably been in the same boat, if not worse. Um, I've heard about some of the amazing efforts of local authorities to turn around timetable changes quickly. Um, I think from our perspective, it's had um, a mixture of a resource impact, but also um, you know, we, we have wanted to do more on um, the timetable service for bus open data and um, in particular the development of agent mode functionality, which we think is really important for boards. Um, because if we're if, if we're going to get all of the smaller operators across the country publishing their data onto boards, there needs to be an agent mode function in the service and so that either local authorities or private agents can publish data on behalf of the smaller operators if that's what the smaller operators wish um, and um, the team have done an amazing job of cracking on and, and you know and have managed to engage with about 10 local authorities on this piece of research but we've got no doubt it would have been easier had um, had local authorities not been dealing with all of the various challenges that they've had to deal with um, during this time. Um, other challenges have been timetable data. Uh, to, be, to be honest, actually, the operators have been, you know, again, amazing. Um, so Stagecoach, Go, Go Ahead and Dari have all put their data onto Bodge during COVID-19. Um, I think National Express have you've got some quite legitimate challenges in that they're a slightly smaller outfit and um, they um their, their key staff members are furloughs and so, so it has impacted that um and similarly first have um you know just that they're also working through the data but they have similar to some of the other operators experienced issues with staff being furloughed um i think other challenges have been really around business change activities so we were planning to um so for anyone who's been involved in the street manager project i know a few of you probably have um, you'll have seen that we had a business change team set up, um, which is an established process now for DFT, for, the, for these digital transformation programmes. And um, for boards, we were planning to set up a very similar type of team, have that all kind of lined up to commence. And um, the social distancing requirements has just meant it, 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 it basically wouldn't offer as good value for money to start that contract right now. Um, we would really need to wait until social distancing requirements have either been significantly reduced or removed before we start that contract. So, so we've, we're still carrying out business change activities, but we're carrying them out remotely and in a slightly different way. Um, and within the existing team, and we'll just really have to see how much we can drive forward by the end of the year. But we would like to get all operators registered for the production environment and um, for, the, for the main bus open data platform um, by the end of this year. Um, so that they can um, get the timetable data on before the statutory requirements bite. 
but also um, be ready and enable to get the location data onto BODS as well. And we really think it's the location data being on BODS that creates a really interesting offer for the data consumers because, you know, as many of you know, um, we've got, um, you know, a really good, well-established as-is offer for um, timetables data and that, that's through the travel line system. Um, so I think it's the location data that becomes quite interesting for the data consumers and, and that's ultimately what this is about. Um, will the stakeholder engagements have been affected? I, I, I mean, to, to be honest, I say that's a challenge in some ways. It's been um, a blessing in some ways because, you know, I suppose um, it's taught everybody in how to make better use of digital technology. And again, that's what this programme is about, it's a digital transformation programme. Um, so you know things like teams and all of the various digital tools and services have been great enablers and um, but you know we have it has meant that there have been some face-to-face -face engagements business change workshops for example that we just haven't been able to deliver um so so we are looking at what we do remotely um but yeah i think that's um that's where we are and then i suppose the final bit is really around fairs um, i know we've got richard um on the call and i'm sure richard will speak to some of these points but we always knew FERS was going to be the, the, the grittiest part of this programme and, yeah, and it is gritty. Um, so we, um, the team, or the Bus Open Data team are cracking on with the development of the FERS publishing platform. And in a lot of ways, that's quite straightforward because it replicates existing functionality that's in timetables, um, in the timetable service. But um, we do want to build a validator for FERS data files, and to some extent, we um, can only do that when we've got FERS data. Um, and then, obviously, the TFN team are cracking on with the development of the FERS data build tool. Um, but the, the kinds of challenges that they face are, are really around the fact that this is the first implementation of NetEx, not just in this country, but NetEx for FERS in the EU generally. Um, we, we, most of the other countries started with timetables. And so you know, it, it, it is a very kind of challenging project, um, the first side. And I think you know, everybody who's been involved in this, Richard, myself, Julie, um, have known right from the start that it was always going to be a risk, NetEx, for the delivery of FERS and the fact that there's a real lack of industry awareness, not just with the operators and the data consumers, but also with the technology suppliers and the people who are and the organizations who are leading that implementation. Um, so that is um, a, you know, a genuine challenge. Um, and so I suppose I've got a few calls to action. I have got a few broader points as well, but to be honest, I, I think we've covered a lot of ground just in, in this slide. Um, but for local authorities, if you know, have already said, if you if you have received an updated NAPTAN data set, but not yet updated it, please do. And um, if you haven't had one, if you do email Rory Miles, um, at kpmg.co.uk and he's part of the best open data service team um, and so has all of the kind of DFT clearances etc and he can provide you with an updated map time data set. Other things are we've written out to local authorities um, requesting for local authorities to complete the operator audit form so basically just outlining who the operators are in their local authority area and then we, we're um, from the end of this month or beginning of July we're going to be targeting a few local authorities each week to onboard their operators. Um, so if you've not yet completed that audit form, um, do complete it. We have actually received you know, quite a significant number back um, which I had completed. Um, so thank you. Um, and then I'd say for any of you who haven't done that yet, please do get in touch. Um, for any of you who are supporting smaller operators and using Romney software, if you can just think about how you might be able to support your smaller operators by giving them their trans exchange files to upload to BODS when we send out the invites um, for them to register for BODS, that would be really helpful. Um, and again, in a similar fashion, um, you know, I know some local authorities have script um, um, schemes with Ticketer and other ETM suppliers and again if, if you know your operators are trying to put their test um, their location data feeds onto boards you know any support you can offer in that space is um, you know again really welcome. Um, just to give you a sense of where we are with boards um, and some of the summary statistics so this is uh, these stats were gathered um, just in early April so they're a little bit out of date now um, but just give you a flavour We've got 39 registered bus operators, and that includes um, Arriva Stagecoach First, Go Ahead. 
Um, we've got 17 publishers, um, and say three of those are um, big five publishers, and then the rest are a mixture of smaller um, and medium-sized operators. Um, we've had 570 unique visitors to the site, um, so 404 of those are new visitors, 166 are returning, 890 sessions, and the average session is about six minutes or 5.49 uh, minutes, 49 seconds. Um, and then this is just um, a, a little bit of information about the, the regs. Um, so um, I've obviously talked about this. I'm happy to share the slides afterwards um, and included there are links to the um, podcast link uh, for the debate itself. Um, and then also, and the debate was only about 30 minutes actually. So um, yeah, definitely worth a watch um, without taking too long. Um, and then the Hansard link for the debate transcript is included too. So we're just about to start writing up. Now that we're in, we've almost finished the development of the location data service and um, working on the first service, we are just about to start writing um, that up in the second edition of the implementation guidance. And that will be published um, just after the regulations are made and just before the service um, moves into public beta um, for location. Um, and then this is just our route map. Um, so, I, I mean, I think the main things are um, from a legislative perspective, um, the legislation is laid in Parliament and will be made in the summer. And then and the, but, um, the stock data requirements for local authorities to maintain update stock data come into effect on the 31st of December 2020. And the requirement to publish timetables data in the, the BODS 2.4 profile also comes into effect on. 31st of December 2020 and um, the first and location date the basic first and location data requirements commence from the 7th of January 2021 um we're I'd say not too worried about the location data requirements in that the service and the function functionality is all there um and um, we're working with each of the major ETM suppliers to make sure that we can ingest their feeds um, uh, but uh, first is um yeah FERS is a tricky one and um, I think that um watch this space. Um, from a digital perspective, so the public beta service for timetables is launched, um, the test service for location data is ready, FERS is the, we're developing the screens, um, and we go for a service assessment in the autumn um, to complete the private beta phase and to launch the location data service and hopefully the first service as well. Um, and then this is just a timeline that sets out um, the different phases and what we're doing. Yeah. And then this is just a little bit of information about some um, of the additional work we're doing on BODS. Um, so we had a, essentially um, different challenges that we wanted to address that we believe are, will be addressed through the BODS extensions. Um, so we wanted to, um, particularly during the transitional period, be able to ingest timetable data in multiple trans exchange versions and formats um, and also to export, particularly to be able to export GTFS, but also um, we know some, um, some of the operators and some data consumers are quite interested to see um, how we can start to provide NetX exports as well. And so we do want to see how we can expedite that um, ahead of actually changing legislation to, to require NetX, which might come in years to come. Um, we wanted to be able to ingest location data in multiple SIRI formats um, just in, in the event that some of the smaller operators might struggle to comply immediately with VM. Um, and as I say, we wanted to provide those um, exports of GTFS, GTFS RT. We did also want to be able to provide functionality for operators to provide punctuality reports, um, which is a statutory requirement from next March. Um, and we wanted to be able to monitor the health of location data feeds um, and that should be enabled for operators, for the technology suppliers and then ultimately for DVSA and the OTC who have the monitoring and, and enforcement activity um, responsibilities. Um, and then beyond that, we also wanted to think about how we automate some of the, manu um, some of the current manual data capture processes in DFT and some of the survey mechanisms. And so, the BODS extensions really speak to each of those challenges. 
And so these are the this is the delivery roadmap for the extensions. And then in terms of um, who we'll be working with, so so we'll be doing a lot of work with um, big five operators and smaller and medium sized operators, the regulators, the DVSA and the OTC, um, and then also local authorities as well. And um, so if you are any of those, um, if you fall into any of those groups um, and would like to be involved in the research, do just drop me a line um, or um, send an email to the Boss Open Data inbox and I um, would be really happy to, to um, get you involved. Um, and that, that's probably, um, I'd say they're probably the main points. Um, Thank you, Mira. Okay. Yeah. Has anybody got any questions on bods for Mira? I've got a, a slight question, if that's okay. Dan Saunders here. Um, so you said about exporting data to GTFS. So at the moment, bods is like a signposting to work, signpost to where operator data is held in the trans exchange mm -hmm. format. So you effectively going to be processing and converting that data to be GTFS and GTFS real time. And also with the FAIR data, do you envisage that coming with GTFS FAIR data in the future? Yeah, so I think in the transitional period, we will provide that as an additional service for data consumers. And um, so I think you're absolutely right. Um, in terms of the, the, the FERS data, um, so at this stage in time, we're slightly limited as to what we can do with FERS data, just simply because um, we don't have any. Um, so uh, it, it's, um, I think that would definitely be the longer term aspiration. But I think there's a bit of a question mark of how long does it take you to, 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 to get a, a substantial FERS data set? And then also, um, you know, for how long does the data consumption industry actually need this level of support uh, through the transitional period because you know one would hope that eventually the market reach it, the marketplace reaches a position of maturity that actually you know it's creating these products and services itself and so we don't need to continue to provide it but we just want to make sure that during the transitional period whilst we onboard operators um, and all of our, all of the operators to publish their particularly their timetables and their location data feeds that we have got a comprehensive data offer for data consumers and um, so that we can start to realize some of the benefits as early as possible and then that just um you know affords that that time during the business change and transitional period to focus on onboarding it, it's um it's nick it's also worth commenting that the fair capabilities of gtfs are, really are extremely limited i mean you can't cover anything like period passes or, or um, day passes or, or, or almost anything except for very simple uh, singles and returns so um, uh, it's there's a lot of mileage in, in using it for UK products. No I tend to agree I think the same with, with GTFS as a standard format is really limited what it can offer compared to trans exchange and as I understand NetEx as well so it just seems uh, it's a, it seems like we're dumbing down the data in a way to provide it for easier access to consumers. Uh, I've got a question. Well, I, I mean, I would see them as compatible. I mean, the, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, no, no, I think what you're saying Sorry. is absolutely right, Nick. Um, all, all I was going to say is, um, so all of the, the raw trans exchange, all of the raw CIVI, et cetera, it will all still be there and available. For, for, because different data consumers will have different needs and different use cases and say so there'll be data aggregators who just want the CIVI VM, who just want the trans exchange. But the, I suppose what you have to have in your mind is, is that from a government perspective, what we have in our minds is um, you know, the, the, the major towns and cities will be really well served by the likes of CityMapper, um, Google, Move It, etc. The, you know, the big app developers. But you go out to the to slightly more rural areas, etc., and, and we want to see benefits realised there. We want to see you know, smaller startup companies be able to quickly and easily take products to market, and they just don't. They, they, those smaller startups just don't have the same level of um, 
either human resource or capital resource behind them to invest like years in developing you know or, or, or months or years in developing you know look curated highly curated data sets and um you know and developing high quality products to take to market so mm -hmm. if we can provide them with the tools to expedite the delivery of those benefits and to support the leveling up agenda to make sure benefits are realized in areas beyond the major towns and cities and beyond the south and you know i think that is fundamentally important and it's absolutely a government aspiration okay uh, Mira, can i ask a question about um the siri vm <clears throat> yes yeah of um, course hi jonathan hello there um Jonathan Raper from Transport API here. Um, obviously, because of uh, COVID-19, we haven't had any BOSS Open Data Implementation Group, so apologies um, for not being up to speed on this, but where are we with the um, UK profile for Siri VM at the moment? Okay. Have we circulated, uh, developed and circulated that now? Yeah, have you, have you not received anything? I, I don't think we've seen it. Um, I, the, okay. the reason I'm asking is obviously the, um, if you, where the centralized service will be ingesting and rebroadcasting mm -hmm. Siri VM, um, yeah. and that will mean that downstream consumers will have to do the um, real time cross referencing to timetables. Um, yeah. And obviously, the full specification of the Siri VM UK profile is quite important as to how people will yeah, do that, how easy or difficult that will be, because at the moment it's, it's quite difficult. Um, mm -hmm. So could could you summarise that? I mean, I may not be the only one who doesn't know where we are with with that at the moment. No, no, that's absolutely fine. Um, so the Siri VM profile has been developed. Um, so and Tim's been Tim Rivet's been really heavily involved in that. Um, so we've had a, a few sessions over the last few weeks just to to get scrutinise it. Um, this week I've just requested some optional fields to be added to support capacity and cleanliness data. Um, and um, two of the team are just drawing up the technical documentation, which Tim will review. Um, and then we'll, um, we should really be able to circulate that. I'd say it definitely in July, but I can send you what we have now already. Um, and a lot of people have already received that. So I'm really sorry if you haven't. No problem. Okay. We're, we're, uh, we're, we're obviously working closely with National Express, um, uh, mm -hmm. who, as you said earlier on, have had some challenges with furloughed staff and so on. Um, yeah, of so course we can probably help with the acceleration yeah, there. I think that'd, be, that'd be fantastic um yeah really helpful i'll make sure um so i'll pick that up and send you um both the siri vm profile and also just the trans exchange documentation as well um and then if you've got any questions on that i'm more than happy to have a follow-up discussion no problem Sorry, thanks very much it's, it's been Sorry, extremely just... hectic for the last few weeks so apologies yeah no i can imagine Sorry, Jonathan, it's probably just worth adding that the groups don't have the detailed profile either. It's just uh, there's a slide that's got some fields that will be in there. And we're expecting, Mira's promised us some operator guidance that gives us some detail about what is exactly going to be in those fields. So we've got a really good piece of work that Tim's done um, that says the sorts of data that needs to be in there. And we've just asked for clarification about if it's a service number, which one from TransExchange is it? And if it's an operator name, which one is it? Um, and some of the other things that aren't clear. So Mira's going to send us the operator guidance. So the groups are no further forward than you, I don't think, in that sense. Will it be, um, will it be fully um, NOC compliant? I hope so, but we don't know yet. Yeah. Um, because that's really that's important um, implementation-wise. Absolutely. Yes. That's 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 the... Um, that's the what's trying to be aimed for um as well as trying to make it clear um um on which which fields for example are you know operator name obviously needs to match noc but you know things like um start and end points and things like that matching actually what's gone into the to the into the bobs routes and timetable mm -hmm. submission so you know actually when you look at it there's not an awful lot of new data in siri vm um because pretty much all of it's actually coming from from trans exchange um because it needs to match so that whatever matching algorithms people have got um if you haven't got running boards and things like that you can do it using um you know uh, other other routes to to get a decent level of prediction generation 
So that's that's the aspiration. Um, at the moment, all that's been published um, are the man are the fields that will be mandated, um, and where those you know the the links with routes and timetables, um, rather than uh, all the optional fields that will be supported. Yeah, I'm quite happy to send that after this meeting. Um, I'm just conscious um, of time and also yeah. that we said we'd do something on um, the COVID-19 challenges around travel apps and what the industry is doing and then some of the things we've been exploring. Um, so I wonder if it's worth just, um, if is. I just do a quick five minutes. Oh. Sorry, Tim, I think we've lost you. Mm. No, yeah. Um, so yeah, it would be okay, well, sensible to move on to to COVID nineteen um, things. So what what we've done is um, so I'll just do a quick five minutes setting the scene, and then what we wanted to do is um, so so one of the requests we've had internally is to start socialising one of the concepts that we've been considering, but it's quite a radical change for the industry. And so we're not looking to implement it at this point in time. And I think it's really important to make that point. Um, but at the same time, we do have in our minds that if there is a, a serious challenge with public transport capacity and government was forced to intervene, then we might have to look at some quite radical solutions. So do you want to just um, spend a bit of time looking at that concept as well? Um, so just to, to set the scene, um, I think back at the end of April, early May, the Secretary of State had set a challenge to the department, which was you know, we wanted to start increasing services again on public transport, both rail and the local transport network, so um, bus, ferry and light rail um, or tram. And um, whilst we would um, work towards 100% service provision, um, social distancing requirements would mean that actually we'd only be able to really um, support about 20% of capacity and actually if you look at the tram network or light rail they can only actually support about 12% capacity um, on, on their network so it's so really you know quite interesting times um, we were asked to think about how we provide information to passengers on both capacity and crowdedness um, on vehicles and um, for the bus industry, in particular for local transport, but primarily the bus industry, there were two primary solutions. Um, so the first solution is probably the one you're most familiar with and has already been implemented. Um, and that is about using the electronic ticket machine to capture additional um, information. And um, so, so obviously we automatically capture boarding, but we don't capture a lighting. And so modifications to ETMs have supported the capturing of a lighting. I think VIX have used an algorithm to just predict the lighting and in it are currently making modifications to their system so so almost all of the the big five operators will have um, now a, a way of um, capturing full volumetric data of sorts for, for their vehicles and um, although there are different challenges associated with this but we think this is actually a really good solution that's been stood up very quickly by the operators in partnership with their technology suppliers and um, that all of the evidence so far suggests that um, the passengers are actually able to effectively use that information which is fed through to um, essentially either the operator app, ticketers app or passenger app um, to, and, and what you end up with is almost like a rag status, so red, amber, green which gives you an indication as to the level of crowdedness on the vehicle and then passengers can make judgments about how to either temporarily disperse, so travel later in the day or at different times, um, or whether to modally disperse, so whether to actually just take it, use a different mode. And so what we've really seen is a, a, a quite a distribution of the peak hour in the morning, particularly in the peak hour is now running up until about 11 a.m. Um, so we do think at the moment that solution is working, um, but we're also quite conscious that We'd always expected that we'd really only start to see true passenger behaviour by the end of June. Um, and then we have another easing of lockdown restrictions to follow, um, probably from the 4th of July. And so we should start to see increasing utilisation of the public transport network, but probably not a significant change in capacity. And so we'd, July might bring a different set of challenges. Um, and so the, the other solution that we did look at as well at the same time was the concept of a reservation system. Now, obviously, we run an open um, bus system in the UK, 
and um, you know, the, the, to move to a reservation system and then essentially close the, close the system um, is you know, quite a radical departure. Um, it's not unfamiliar in the rail industry where reservations are quite widely used. Um, the tram industry and light rail are not um, to, to their slight, they're, they're slightly more open to the concept because they share some cultural affinities with rail. Um, but I think for the bus industry, it, it would represent a significant departure and essentially it would be a, a, a government intervention if it was required. Um, there are other countries that have introduced reservation systems across the whole of the public transport network, including bus, in response to COVID-19. And I think if we did see significant challenges again, to the network and, and um, so if we did see significant challenges in the future to the network and capacity we we're all fully aware internally that we, we might need to return to the drawing board on solutions and so we are sharing this concept across the industry to start to understand with stakeholders both their reactions to it but also the implementation challenges as well um, and so I think I'm going to hand over to um, Johan um, from Eco World, who had so Eco had presented the, the solution for the reservation system in partnership with Google. Um, I think Johan can talk you through the the, the concept and um, and then invite some questions towards the end. Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks for the for the intro there, Mira. I appreciate it. So I'm I'm just going to jump right in to share some slides, if that's okay with everyone here. Um, so one second. Uh, is everyone able to see uh, this this slide here? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yes. Great. So. Um, so again, this is sort of a, a concept, as Mira mentioned, that that we've been uh, sh sharing with a number of of uh, in industry folks, and and again, we're just sort of using using this to get uh, get get some feedback and 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 thoughts on on this from from this um, uh, this team here. So I think. Um, just as a sort of way of background information, of course, um, I don't need to tell any uh, of the folks in this virtual room uh, this, uh, of course, but COVID-19 has created sort of a really unique set of, of circumstances um, that I think have never been experienced before on, on public transport and, and really related to the sort of lowered levels of, of, of ridership uh, and, of course, the mix of uh, available uh, supply in, in in the form of vehicles, which is which is slowly slowly coming back to to running a full service. But but certainly in the beginning there was a greatly reduced uh, supply as well. But um, because the ridership has been uh, so greatly reduced, there is an, a sort of an opportunity, if you will, um, to to rethink how we might provision a set of services. And it is probably only. Uh, when there is a, a disruption uh, of, of this magnitude that you could possibly even think about doing something like this um, because obviously, you know, mostly, especially buses are, are running at, you know, uh, over 100% oftentimes uh, in terms of capacity um, when when everything is normal. Um, so, so this is quite a very unique situation. And, and so we wanted to look at how we might be able to solve a short-term uh, problem, relatively short-term problem of safety and crowding, while putting in place a really interesting foundation that, that could help enable a, a more modern system going forward. So that was sort of the, the, the challenge that we thought about when we when we came up with this this idea. And we made some assumptions uh, around that that I'll share with you. So one of them was that you know, COVID is likely to, to be with us for a, a significant period of time in one way, shape or form, um, and will require likely will require uh, uh, social distancing that, that may be, be increasing or decrease, decreasing over time, depending on, on the situation on the ground. And maintaining trust with passengers this is going to be extremely important, right? And, and we've seen that in, in lots of surveys already that, that, that there's a, a significant portion that's quite nervous about getting back on, on public transport. And therefore, providing evidence of uh, proactive measures to, to ensure both safety and and impact ensure the availability to 
to to uh, travel will also um, help, help increase that trust. And we anticipate, of course, that as more people start to get back on public transport uh, while maintaining the reduced capacity, there's going to just be um, natural problems of increased crowding at stops and, 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 and stations and, and also passenger perceptions of availability, like sort of the guaranteed ability to travel may become bigger problems if, if there's a significant volume of people that return to uh, to public transport uh, while social distancing restrictions are in place. So we thought about this and, and, and thought that there are really three questions that need to be answered in order to sort of be able to balance supply, demand, and, and crowding. Um, what, the first is, of course, how many passengers are on a vehicle at any given time. So that's how many people are on the vehicle right now and how many people will be on the vehicle in the future. Uh, where are additional passengers going to get on? and where will additional passengers get off? So if you could actually answer all three of those questions, you'd have everything you need to sort of optimize the usage of whatever uh, assets uh, you have available given the restrictions uh, while maintaining a, a safe em environment. Um, so how can you answer those three questions without installing uh, lots of hardware? Um, and that's just, even if you did install lots of hardware, it'd be very tricky to, uh, understand the sort of demand on the street, if you will, rather than just the demand uh, within the vehicles. And so our, our idea there was to talk about a reservation system that can, can be applied to all modes. So this is really about creating advanced reservations. It does support um, the use of sort of various at-stop boarding scenarios as well. Um, but but the core of it is really about uh, advanced reservations. And it would require each passenger to specify uh, a time and an origin destination stop. Um, and with that information, we would have um, the answers to the, the, the three questions that we mentioned on the slide before, uh, and we can all optimize the system accordingly. This is really separate from uh, an actual ticketing system. So this is sort of, for lack of a better phrase, a permit to travel, right? So it overlays on any existing ticketing and uh, uh, systems that already exist. And it can support hard capacity limits, right? So you, you can actually limit the number of people that can uh, get on a bus, and then you can actually enforce that uh, if that's a requirement as well. So how would this work? Well, throughout this presentation, we're going to uh, talk about buses as an example because we, we had to choose one mode. But the scope of the concept is really for all, all modes across GB. So it could be light rail or, 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 or trams or coaches or what, what, whatever it might be. So I'm going to go through a very sort of uh, stylized uh, example here just to, to help get the point across. And again, I mentioned that there can be hybrid solutions that are, uh, allow for uh, at, at stop boarding and so on and so forth. But this example is sort of a pure reservation system to help kind of get the point across. So in this case, we're seeing a bus traveling along. It has a maximum capacity of 10 people. Um, and there are currently five uh, passengers on it that have an existing reservation. And we know when each of those five passengers is going to get off because that's part of the, uh, the reservation system is requiring uh, when you make a reservation to define your 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 boarding stop and your 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 alighting spot. So as this um, uh, bus drives along to to stop B, we see that there are three more passengers with reservations who then get on on the bus. So now the capacity is eight out of ten uh, pa passengers. Um, no passengers got off the bus, and actually there's zero unmet demand at this particular point. As the bus uh, drives along and it approaches stop B, there are eight passengers on it, but the system knows that one of those eight passengers is going to get off at stop B, at B. Therefore, it can make three uh, uh, reservations available. So three uh, additional people board at stop B. There's also one, uh, uh, two passengers that tried to get a reservation on this particular trip uh, to try and get on at stop B, but they were unable to because the bus was already at full capacity. So the experience for those uh, two passengers is that they would be told that um, actually there's no room on this bus at this particular time. Uh, I'll give you the alternative times, which could be either earlier or later times. Uh, it could provide alternative routes or alternative modes, such as bike sharing and so on and so forth. And all of that unmet data, as well as the actual uh, or sort of unmet uh, demand data, as well as the actual demand data inside of the bus would all be sent back 
to the uh, operators and and and, um, and and authorities. So there's quite a lot of risk back uh, to help optimize the system further. So the vehicle carries on, the bus carries on driving, and at stop C, uh, it's noted that actually there's no reservations at stop C, um, and there are no passengers that have um, uh, specified stop C as their destination stop, and therefore the driver can actually drive right past stop C uh, since there's there's no need to uh, no need to stop there. And then again, at, as it the bus progresses at stop D. There is one passenger uh, that has specified stop D as their destination. Therefore, they're going to get off. Uh, it makes room for one additional reservation. Uh, therefore, kind of maintaining the maximum capacity on that particular bus. And once again, there was there was one additional person who uh, tried to make a reservation but could not. They presented the alternatives, and all of that information again is is is, is sent on to the uh, to to the operators and authorities for for maximizing it. So that again, in this sort of highly stylized example, is is uh, how, how the basic system works. Um, so, BODS is sort of like the backbone for this and has all of the information that's required um, to 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 manage the the scheduling elements of this. That sort of multimodal reservation system sits on top of that, and it's really an API, right? So that API um, would be exposed in a variety of different areas, right? Or 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 end user applications. So be surfaced through um, global and and local journey planners. So, for instance, uh, you know Google Maps could uh, integrate this API and make it possible to actually not only uh, plan a journey but actually reserve um, a, a spot on any particular journey. And the same is true for you know City Mapper and and, and Move It and others, right? Um, it can integrate with onboard hardware, so it can integrate with existing ticketing machines and, and custom driver apps as well. So that would um, enable the, the driver to have a lot more rich information, knowing when people are going to get on and off, what the you know, uh, accessibility requirements might be um, ahead of time, and so on and so forth. And then the authority and, and of course, operator solutions themselves um, might be delivering apps and, 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 and websites or even phone reservation-based systems uh, for those with limited digital access and so on. And then another key element of this is the, is, is the demand data archive. So all of that information, regardless of whether a reservation is made or attempted to be made through uh, Google Maps or, or an, an operator-owned solution or wherever it might come from, all of that demand data and even the unmet demand data would be archived and made available uh, directly to the authorities and operators to to help deliver a better service and, and, and improve operations. So this, that's a, a very valuable element of this. So as we mentioned before, as I mentioned before, the, the sort of implementing a reservation system isn't necessarily a binary decision. Um, it is possible to implement sort of a hybrid solution that also allows for, for walk-up service. I'll just kind of talk through that. You can think of this as really a, a sort of continuum, if you will, uh, that represent two sort of extremes. On the left-hand side, you've got a pure walk-up system with no reservation service. That's sort of the current status and, and the sort of pre-COVID uh, way of doing things. And then on the right-hand side, you've got a pure reservation system where there's no walk-up service allowed. And, and that's sort of in the example that I, I, I walked you through just uh, before. But there's plenty of room in the middle there. So if you sort of look at... Um, moving from the pure reservation system and, and slightly towards the left, it's possible, for instance, to make at-stop reservations by a passenger or even the driver making an at-stop um, uh, reservation. That's sort of like uh, the way trains handle things. You need to have a, a, a reservation, but you can make that reservation at the last minute. Um, if you move further along, uh, a portion of the capacity could be reserved for reservations and a portion of the capacity could be reserved for walk-ups. That's almost like a, a restaurant style reservation system, if you will, where um, they will, will hold uh, some capacity for walk-ins and so on. And then again, further left, this, the, the driver could actually bypass the system. That, that's not such a great option because um, you lose a lot of data there and so on. So it is a, it is a continuum here. And if we look at the sort of uh, the, 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 the compare and contrast between the two extremes, if you will, on, on the left-hand side, the sort of pure, a uh, walk-up system, of course, it's a familiar experience that, uh, that, that, that everyone's been doing for a long time. Um, there's less control over crowding on vehicles um, because it's sort of generally manually uh, managed and, and puts uh, a lot of responsibility on, on, on the driver to, to keep an eye on things. 
Um, there's no control over crowding at, at stops or stations there. So there's people will still turn up and, and try and get on a vehicle. They may be waiting there for a long time if there's a lot of demand, but 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 they're still going to show up and, and form crowds at, at stations and stops. And again, it relies on passengers to self-organize. And, you know, Mir mentioned that so far people have spread themselves. Um, I think that'll likely become a bigger issue as, as, as um, demand increases if the capacity is still... Uh, limited, it'll become just more difficult to uh, self-organize at scale uh, when when you're talking about masses of people. Um, it's difficult to guarantee social distancing, uh, clearly, um, uh, w w without additional controls. And it's obviously impossible to guarantee availability, right? So as things get more busy, your wait times may increase significantly. But on the hand, there's no, ch no change required here. Um, if we con con contrast that with a pure reservation system, um, that is clearly a new experience, um, but it has some advantages. It does allow you sort of complete control of the crowding of vehicles because you'll know exactly how many people are on there and you'll uh, um, only allow the people who have reservations to board. Um, it, of course, provides improved uh, control of the crowding at stops or stations because basically you're disincentivizing people to turn up at stops or stations. Um, because unless they have a reservation, um, the, the, there's no point in being there. Um, and it provides a system to sort of organize passengers at scale, right? So if everyone has to make a reservation, you have to pre-plan your trip by and large, and it will provide alternatives ahead of time. And you will know ahead of time that you have to either leave earlier or later or find an alternative. Uh, and the app can obviously guide you through that experience. But it provides a sort of a system for passengers to organize themselves at scale if there is um, much more dem if a demand uh, outstrips supplies. Uh, in volume. And of course, it is easier to guarantee social distancing because you have these hard caps on the number of people on vehicle. And indeed, you can guarantee availability for those with the reservation. So, um, you know, from a sort of brand promise perspective, it's possible to say, yes, if as long as you have a reservation, we will, we, we will get you there. But um, again, change is required for this. So I'll just talk through sort of a, a couple of the different experiences uh, very quickly here. So from a passenger experience perspective, the way it would work is that you would use one of these apps to uh, request a reservation using, uh, you know, de defining the origin, the destination, and the, and the time that you want to travel. If that's available, um, the passenger would receive a, a, a token of sorts, and that would be a, a QR code or NFC or something similar. Um, and if it's unavailable, again, uh, the passenger would be given uh, the, the closest available time that could be before or after the, the, your, your ideal time and then could uh, provide alternative routes and alternative modes and you know, bike sharing and or whatever, whatever, whatever else um, uh, you wanted to push people towards. And then the token would allow you to board the vehicle, right? So that, that uh, enables passengers to basically just arrive at the stop um, just a little bit before the bus is scheduled to leave and then, and then be able to get on uh, with the, the sort of comfort of knowing that you're definitely going to be able to get on uh, that particular vehicle. And the reservation time window is really specified by policy. So how far ahead can you reserve? Is it 24 hours or 48 hours? That It's not technology dependent. It's just based on policy. And similarly, how close to the time when the bus departs, you can make a reservation if one becomes available, uh, is again a policy decision whether you choose to make that you know, right up until the time when the bus departs or whether it's uh, an hour before, that's that's it, just policy-based. It can provide um, priority booking for specific groups as well. So for instance, key workers or other identified vulnerable groups can be uh, given priority booking status so, so that they're uh, more able to get, uh, more easily able to get seats uh, on, on, on the buses uh, ahead of time. And of course, accessible uh, seats are handled really well um, because uh, you could actually specify that you need an accessible seat um, uh, and and you would know if that is available on that particular bus or or if 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 uh, there are no um, additional accessible seats available on that particular journey and so on. And again, we talked a little bit about how walk-up reservations can be accepted. In terms of the at-stop experience, I think one of the main points about this is that it disincentivizes large groups of people waiting at stops um, uh, or, or in stations. And I think this is a very significant element, right? Because, you know, again, if demand begins to outstrip uh, supply um, at, at, at scale, there'll be a lot of people standing around waiting for quite a long time, and um, uh, that, that will become a problem. Again, for those reservations, there's nothing to queue or, or bunch for. Everyone's going to get a good seat. 
Um, from a driver uh, perspective, we wanted to um, look at a solution that would really free the driver from having to sort of judge and manage safety. The idea is to sort of reduce driver fatigue, right? So there's no need to sort of manually count or deprecate people leaving and so on and so forth, which again, um, um, could become more difficult, especially if um, you allow slightly more people on a bus and uh, due to changing um, social distancing uh, requirements and so on and so forth. And nonetheless, it, it, it would provide a sort of a more objective measure of whether someone is allowed on the bus or not, and, and takes away some of this sort of potentially uh, passenger perceived subjectivity of, of, of whether a driver allows someone on or off. And in terms of authenticating those reservations, there's a number of different options. Obviously, you can use things like QR codes and, and NFC and, or access codes to validate um, by either onboard software or a custom driver app. Um, and it can even take manual driver validation as fallback using some pretty sort of obvious visual cues that can be inspected at a distance uh, by, a, by a driver as well. And the dr a driver app or a ticket machine can also integrate this API, as we mentioned before, and then that way they can know how many passengers are actually expected. So that allows additional options, right? So you can, can have an option to dwell if you're expecting key workers or, or you're at a, at a, at a connection. Um, and again, you know accessibility needs in advance and so on and so forth. And, and, and you can pass a stop if there's, if there's no one getting off or, or who has a reservation to get on as we, as we already covered. And then from an, from an operator uh, experience perspective, um, makes it easier to comply with changing government guidance, right? So, you know, maybe um, the capacity increases, uh, uh, the allowed uh, or, or guided capacity for individual buses increases, and then you, this is really just a configuration, and then perhaps the rate of infections increases and you need to lower that, and again, that's just a configuration, and it, and it can kind of move up and down as needed, so it's easier to comply with whatever the sort of uh, government guidance is at any point in time. And hopefully it enables the you, optimal use of whatever assets are available uh, for, for operators to use at any given time. And again, help to reinforce the service promise. If you have a reservation, you'll for sure be able to travel. Right? Um, it's easy to integrate with uh, operator apps as well. So um, that, that, that can be slotted, the API can be slotted directly into operator apps as well. And then of course, one of the key value propositions for, for, for operators is that you get massively improved understanding of demand, including unmet demand, because all of this rich data coming from a variety of app providers, not just the operators app providers, will be driving all of that data directly back to the operators um, to be able to help better manage supply and demand with greater visibility into uh, in, in, into uh, what what passengers are, are asking for, and perhaps uh, will allow them to become more de demand responsive over time. In, 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 in certainly in certain scenarios, from a government experience perspective, this um, makes uh, transit arguably safer and, and enables policy to be sort of more easily executed because there are some sort of controls and levers, if you will, around this. Um, it provides a mechanism to actively spread passenger demands um, while giving visibility into really what other passengers are doing, right? Um, and fine-grained control over prioritization for, for key passenger groups, which could be quite important, especially for key workers and so on. And, and of course, they would also get the improved understanding of, of demand and supply of, of transport and, 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 and very rich insights into how this gets managed. So just kind of summarizing this here, um, the, the overall sort of benefits of this is the sort of fine gain control over crowding for, for safe use of transport. Talked about the spread of demand temporarily to or, or to alternative routes and, and modes and so on. And maximizing utilization rates for whatever allowable capacity exists. Um, and, and again, disincentivizing the gathering at stops. We think that's really a key one. And then of course the, the rich information um, and, and insights that, that can be derived from that. Um, I'll take, Two more minutes, if I may, just to talk through, there's a couple of sort of FAQs that always come up. We covered many of these already, but um, you know, does it require billing to be integrated? No, it certainly doesn't. Um, this is really uh, sits on top of that billing and ticketing system. It can be integrated, billing and ticketing can be integrated if you wanted to create a more seamless experience where you simply book and you know, even pay directly through, um, through these various apps. And if you, if, if there was a desire to expose that in the future, can be done. 
when it's not required. Reservation, we talked about how it can handle key workers. Um, uh, we talked about it being able to, to, to automatically recommend the, the closest available, temporarily closest available um, service or, or to other routes and, and services and modes. Um, Anyone can integrate with the reservation system that has been given permission to integrate with it, right? So um, if this was a DFT run thing, then DFT would uh, choose who would be allowed to have access, but anyone who they authorize uh, would be able to integrate it into their apps. Privacy-wise, the backend system has no um, personally identifiable information in it at all. So uh, all of the identities are, are completely anonymized. Uh, so, so there's 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 no uh, access to, to personally identifiable information within the system. Um, again, we talked about how this uh, can be used to actively kind of modify uh, uh, passenger behavior. And when restrictions ease, again, the capacity can change and the ca capacity can vary by region, by line, by city, by whatever, um, and can have different capacity levels and different booking time windows and so on based, based on needs. Um, it can work on subways, might be a little bit different, but provide access to, you know, a 10 minute window to get in, for instance, again, to try and reduce crowding at substations. Um, again, light rail, trans coach works the same way. Um, in terms of accessibility and digital exclusion issues, um, there's a variety of different uh, options there. If people don't have smartphones, but they have computers, they can, uh, you know, use use a desktop version and, and print out a code uh, or, or be given a, a simple passphrase to get. Uh, the solution can also be used to support phone-based services at a national or regional level to provide sort of a bureau reservation service for passengers with certain accessibility needs or those without uh, any digital access whatsoever. And uh, of course, we talked about already how it can integrate with ETM uh, hardware and so on. And then lastly, I just want to answer this and how, how could this evolve in the future? So the interesting thing about this would be that if this system gets embedded into all of the sort of global and local journey planners, you have this sort of wiring, if you will, already into the significant players in, in the UK market. And once that wiring existed, what else could you do with that? And, you know, for instance, if you wanted to enable and implement uh, digital payments at the same time as you're making a reservation, or you wanted to allow the reservation system in the long term to fall away and simply push um, uh, this through digital payments and so on and so forth, all of that sort of plumbing, if you will, has already happened. Uh, and those connections uh, are, have already been made to all of the major players. And so there's all kinds of interesting things that could be done um, in the slightly longer term to, 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 to evolve this system to deliver you know, a more modern uh, transport uh, system in general. So that's all I wanted to share with you um, today. But uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer any um, you know, specific questions or, 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 or um, uh, talk about this concept further with you. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Johan. Um, there's potentially quite a lot of um, questions that, that come out of, of this. Um, has anybody got any high level ones? Um, and perhaps more detailed ones could be uh, could be could be passed to to Johan separately. Mira, um, could could I ask you introduced um, Johan um, to talk about this? Is is um, DFT actually considering primary legislation to ask uh, operators to require pre-booking on buses? Um, no, I think that's a really good question, Jonathan, and really actually quite helpful in clarifying the landscape. Um, so at the moment, what we have is non-statutory guidance around COVID-19. And, and so we are asking operators to encourage passengers to plan their journeys in advance and to provide passengers with the tools to do so. And similarly, in the passenger guidance, we're encouraging passengers to plan their journeys in advance and to spread across and um, to spread their travel out across the day and consider all the modes. But, but currently it's all non-statutory with the exception of face masks, which is actually going through the, the um, it's not primary legislation, primarily it would be delivered through secondary. And um, it might well be, I, I mean, I think it's really important to make the point that at the moment, the, the network is performing um, in the sense that 
there isn't an imbalance between supply and demand and so we're not concerned right now but I think Johan made the point that um, that could quite easily change and I think that that exact I, I think CFT are well aware of that and are monitoring the situation on a weekly basis um, and also receiving daily stats as well um, I think we'll continue to look at this through June and through July um, and then if, if we do think that there are emerging mm -hmm. issues um, we will rethink so we're planning to send another submission up later in the month um, to provide Secretary of State with an update on how, how the network is doing um, and yeah, as I say if we saw issues emerging then we might have to mm -hmm. rethink the solutions that are being recommended to Secretary of State um, and it might well be that um, if you if you did look at more radical solutions, you could either go through the the, 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 the non-statutory route, i.e. you provide the tools to support non-statutory guidance, or if actually some hard measures were needed, you could actually then start to amend secondary legislation. If there was adequate secondary legislation uh, or, um, that it could be tied to, otherwise, as you say, then um, you probably have to look at what primary legislation was going through in relation to COVID and could you, could you, could you deal with it in that way. But, but I think it's really important to make the point that we are not considering legislating on this um, at all. And currently, at the moment, the recommended solution to sector of state is around operators providing their own information through their ECMs, through their apps some products and services about capacity and crowdedness so that passengers make their own judgment but we are not enforcing um, the the provision of a reservation system and um, but we do think it's important to to share the concept with the industry should we need to move in that direction in the coming weeks or months okay okay is that any Anything else? Any more questions about this? Yeah, I just want to make one final point, Tim, if that's okay. Um, I think it is just also worth noting that um, so the, the responses um, from the industry have been quite mixed. Um, and so um, generally, I'd say on balance, it's um, it, you, a national re reservation system would not be favoured at this moment in time. But and um, to be fair, face masks weren't favoured either, and we had to take a decision on it because that's what passengers needed to feel reassured. Um, but I think the, the the point that is worth noting is that the, the degree, so there are varying views, particularly amongst the big five, about what, what you would want to do around the reservation system. For example, first are actually looking at, I wouldn't say they're bought into the idea of reservation system, but they are open to it and are, are looking to pilot um, their own solution actually out in the southwest, um, and so I think it, it I think it is important to, to 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 not only think about how we provide a system that meets the needs of our existing patronage base, um, but to also think about how we provide solutions and systems that meet the needs of new patronage bases for the future. Um, and I think that's exactly what First are doing. And I, I suppose I just encourage to, to kind of watch that space and to, to 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 be open to those innovations and to look at how those trials are landing um we'll certainly be watching that with interest in dft and i'm thinking about how we share the findings with the wider industry yeah okay thank you um so um thank you for that um before we move on to um a, a wider is there anything to pick up on 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 covid19 it feels like a, a sensible time to uh to have a couple of minutes for a, a comfort break um i know there's been uh, there's been at least one request um so uh, if we take a couple of minutes to to have a comfort break and uh, and come back um think about it the milling round that the, the 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 coffee at CPT or something like that. Um, uh, so, uh, so we'll be back in a uh, in a couple of minutes if you need one.
So, Julie, while people are having a, a break, is it worth you saying something briefly about your data collection tool, uh, about COVID data? I mean, I would, but I just think we've just spent a lot of time on an item we weren't expecting. So I think it would be handier just to get on and deal with some of the stuff that is relevant now. So, I, I mean, I yeah. can if you want, but I just feel like it's probably time to move on to the rest of the agenda. I mean, okay. I can give you an update um, and link to put out to go with the papers if that helps. Yeah, no, that would be good. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks, Tim, anyway. Yeah. I'm going to take when Teresa comes back, um, <laughs> when we restart. As soon as we need her to, uh, for, for the record. She may just have become recumbent, Tim. Uh, that's very true, Jonathan, yeah, yeah. And we are recording actually, so um, we could uh, just uh, just carry on. Uh -huh. Okay, so now we have Teresa, um, we'll, um, <laughs> we'll get going again. Um, so um, we've talked about location data, um, the, um, the statutory instrument dates um, that Mira was talking about, we circulated a um, uh, a couple of slides that Artig had put together on on the dates and and the key data formats and links. Um, so hopefully you find those uh, useful. Um, if you find anything wrong with them, let me know. Um, Trans exchange profile. Um, unfortunately, Stuart's given apologies um, at the last minute. Um, as some of you know. Um, Stuart is um, retiring from public transport duties um, and taking up a new life um, as a secondary school teacher um, in physics, um, officially from September, but um, is in the process of, uh, of, of um, going through training and, and working up um, in what must be a very challenging period of time where you're trying to teach um, kids remotely. Um, so uh, I think he's very brave um, and it's a very admirable thing to be doing. Um, unfortunately, he can't be with us 
today, but we did have a, a couple of hours with him um, last month um, on um, the uh, on the trans exchange profile and had a good discussion um, with him there and fed a few things back. Um, I know that he's had a few more comments outside of that and he's on with revising the um, documentation. Uh, there's a few technical things and a few sort of presentational things that he's working through. Um, and um, as Mira said uh, earlier, um, expecting a, a revised version out in um, July, um, which we will then need to make sure is, is widely um, shared within the industry um, to make sure um, people understand what they need to be doing um, and some of the nuances in it, particularly um, for links to real time and, uh, and fares um, so that people can, can link all the data up together. Okay. Um, so um, thought it would be, was worth uh, inviting Giuseppe Solazzo um, from um, the DFT um, to say a few words um, about the NAPTAN project that he's running in the department. Yes, Tim, I'll try and have my camera on, although I'm not entirely sure this is going to work. So if I start breaking up, please let me know and I will switch it off. Uh, yeah, so I, I know many of you on this call. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Giuseppe Solas. I, the, um, I lead the central data team at, at DFT. And uh, among my team's responsibility, we also have the management of uh, the, say, the servicing of the NAPTAN database. Now, there's a few things that we're doing with that. Uh, first of all, uh, you probably know, if you are users of NAPTAN, that there is a relatively old system um, that allows uh, data producers to upload their data to uh, to the NAPTAN uh, process so that the uh, database is created. Now, that system um, must be refreshed for a number of reasons, including the fact that there is new accessibility legislation coming into force in September. And with that as a main driver, but also as an excuse, I would say, uh, we've started with our own digital service to, um, uh, to, to, to research how uh, to redesign the whole process. So um, I would say things are going to happen in in, uh, in phases, but the first phase is uh, definitely trying to look at the website itself, uh, the guidance, the documentation that uh, we have on NAPTAN, while also making sure that we bring the service into our uh, new infrastructure. So DFT had a major move towards Google Cloud Platform, uh, and in order for the service to be uh, manageable by by our services, we need to bring it into, into GCP. So that's part of the uh, of the um, of the project. Other things we're doing is, of course, also having a look at the standard itself and the the different versions of the NAPTAN standard. So there are uh, clearly issues in, um, in 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 a sense that we receive data under different versions of the same standard, uh, and um, you know just to to be really honest, there are there, there is a certain degree of confusion as to what's the the output of that process and what version of the standard we should be publishing the data under. So we're looking at that as well. Um, part of this piece of work separately, we're also looking at data quality in NAPTAN. Um, th there are a variety of, of processes and variety of tools, I would say, used by the community. I mean, Johan was here. There's uh, uh, and either word have been uh, developing a tool for data quality. There's uh, the guys at Passenger have been launching a, a platform to, to check uh, data quality or bus stops and data reliability in a sense of bus stops. So what we're trying to do is uh, we, we're doing an exercise to uh, to do um, data quality checks and uh, DFT for internal purposes. But as a side effect, I would say we'll be releasing uh, a set of, uh, of checks to provide a baseline uh, library to the community and start engaging uh, on, on that uh, with all of you. And the last bit I wanted to mention is um, we, we are realizing that NAPTAN needs probably um, steering for the future. Uh, now, there's a number of 
applications and uh, procedures that are based on maps and data. Uh, and it's great to have Nick here because he's sort of been responsible for, for, for that uh, in the past. Um, and, you know, we want to have a frank conversation about what we should be doing with NAPTEM uh, in the future. Uh, you know, we, we often like to, uh, to talk about how you know, we're, we're going to have autonomous vehicles, uh, but, you know, we, it, it's really hard to think about that you know, vision for future transport if we, we don't have accurate data about where the bus stops are, for example. And uh, there is some anecdotal evidence that uh, there is a variety in, in the accuracy of, for example, location data or bearings uh, of the bus stops within NAPTA. So that, that's, these are all the, let's say, directions that we want to explore. Um, so yeah, this was just a very brief update of where we're up to. Uh, major reason for me to be here is to try and start engaging with this group uh, because I suspect you all know more than I do uh, about NAPTA itself. So it would be good to, to start engaging uh, and see how we can bring this forward. So th that, that's all for me. Yep, okay. Thank you. It's good to uh, good to meet you and put a, a face to a face to a name, um, and uh, and I think generally Petic um, appreciates um, some some engagement. Um, we've th there's been a bit of a dearth of, of that on Naptan for a, for a few years, um, and um, <laughs> it is so key to to so much that that we're trying to do um so uh so it's welcomed um has anybody got any immediate I have, questions yeah <laughs> um i wonder whether um people like transport api uh and um uh, you know uh, peter stoner and friend like that I, w I wonder whether um we think that a it would be a quick and beneficial fix to make naptan a restful service, um, and and whether Giuseppe has has views on that. So perhaps take first, you know, um, hmm. the the aggregator view, and then see whether Giuseppe could support. Yeah, Jonathan, it's Jonathan right around. Or... Yes, yes, I'm I'm here. I'm just um, I'm oh. just trying to um, I'm just trying to think what the um, the benefits would be i mean obviously at the moment it's a static data set which everybody downloads and uh and integrates at their own interval making it um restful would allow you to do continuous updates it would then potentially if you didn't have editions of naptam uh it would place resp responsibilities on people to always be calling the service uh, in order to have a definitive view. If you did that, then you generate polling load. And polling load obviously is um, borne by the supplier, the provider, which would be DFT. Uh, you could have a streaming. Streaming might be better uh, rather than, than RESTful because then you could stream out all the changes. But again, you'd have to ensure that everybody was consuming it all the time. So I think you would probably want to think about the question of um, versioning and the advantages and disadvantages of having everybody on the same version even though it was a week out of date versus um you know having having a continuously up, up, updated service i'm sure julie would probably have a view on this as well yeah, and you'd still have edge cases like if if you know if a stop is going to be moved temporarily next week or something like that but um uh, so you want to be able to do, when you're doing things like journey planning where you want to the, the the stop as it is now and the stop as it is then and so on so uh, a rest, a, you know having everyone on the single rest api doesn't cover all the cases um but I mean, more widely, I mean, I, I really welcome the idea of, of looking at uh, how to evolve NAPTAN and take it forward. And uh, I would um, just flag up with some other interesting um, aspects of stop content we should, we should be looking at um, that we can draw on quite a lot from Transmodel and, and NetX um, as we go forward. I mean, both covering things like flexible stops and better accessibility data in stop places and, and uh, other, other other points. I think um, I think Nick makes a really good point about um, 
planning into the future because we've talked about the government's guidance for public transport for people to plan their journeys on public transport of course where the stop's going to be next week and how full the bus is going to be next week in terms of capacity and reservations isn't available in that format and in, in actual fact at the moment the bods api you can't call data for next week you can only call it for today so i think we've got to be careful to remember that people will want to travel into the future and not just today so yeah i do think it's a good idea to have a restful api for all the reasons that um, have been outlined but just let's not forget people want to plan ahead i i travel into the future but i'm never going back to 2020. <laughs> you're you're not nick but there are plenty of people that do use um, Naptown and have interesting stashes of trans exchange for network analysis going back in time um, and, uh, and some um, business yeah. case stuff needs that. So we do need to be careful, um, I, as, as it says, to make sure that we, that we meet all the, the different use cases. Yeah. I think there are also two questions I'd like to ask you. So one, of course, is about the the, the, the clarity for, for all of you of how NAPTAN is, is generated uh, as a database, because I, I know that the process is very convoluted and some people look at me in, in, in surprise and in shock when I describe them how it, it comes to be. So I, I think part of the issue of, is about simplifying that process and making sure that that process becomes clearer. Uh, and I mean, the, the discovery that digital services have run uh, has found quite a diversity of views of how that should be done. So there are local authorities who will prefer a you know completely uh, you know time system in which they have to resupply, reprovide their data uh, once a week or once every two weeks or whatever it is. And there are other users who clearly would prefer the the current model in which they provide data whenever they want and we regenerate the database. Uh, but I, I'd like to hear your views about what do you think is the best way? Uh, and clearly, you know, having a RESTful API would be part of the solution. But I, I guess a, a key aspect of this is also the way we're going to be aggregating the data and the way we're going to be managing the versioning of data. At the moment, Napton is here and now. Uh, I don't know if anyone has been collecting historical versions of Napton. Probably not. Uh, th there is a question to us, should we provide that? function and uh, allow people to to see what that was three months ago uh, or, or, or in three months time we've uh, at base up we've got a version of laptop and uh, nap time sorry every week going back to 2012 we, we download it we keep it it's useful for comparison we're looking at old data where stops might have been located and you know, when they were deleted and things like that so yeah we've got we've got a lot of uh, csv files sat on the server somewhere we keep the national data set for at least two years um we've got every week and every time we we, we process we, we maybe keep that database um as an archive so that's always useful for planners and people who are looking back and taking screenshots of comparisons from one year to another and there'll be an awful lot of that after covid you know as comparisons before and after and during this period so i think archiving is really important versioning is at the heart of this um giuseppe because um I, I'm, I'm, you know, BODS is not going to be versioned. It's going to be assumed um, the current version is the version you can get today. But there's a time horizon between when somebody can upload it and when somebody can download it. So um, the, sa and the, the same is going to be true of the um, uh, the uh, of the M data. So I think we're going to we will have a versioning problem in the brave new world of BODs. Um, we've also then got boundaries with the devolved nation, you know, with the other nations. Um, and I'm not sure yet we've we've thought about how that's going to be handled. We're going to require reasoning over multiple data sets, TNBS and BODs, and then AVL sources, and then NAPTAN. So what I would advocate is that whatever is done to NAPTAN, it's done in the, you know, it's designed into that matrix I, I suspect the bod may have to become versioned um and probably naptan should you know plug into whatever ultimate design evolves yeah i mean that's a very good point jonathan everything should fundamentally be versioned as otherwise we you you just can't manage uh, both the the wide scale sort of rolled out distribution where different people are picking it up at different times um and also you can't do the historic analysis um, 
But I, I mean, I, I very much like Giuseppe's point that really, it, we, when we think about nap time, we're actually talking about three different things. One is the workflow by which the data gets assembled and aggregated. The second is the content model as to what's actually in there. And then the third is the exchange formats uh, that we actually use when we're rendering it to pass between computers. And those are actually three separate things. And we need a sort of separate discussion on on each of those three aspects. Um, and, and as far as the content model, of course, one of the interesting things to think are, are that there are one or two extra things that with fares, we'll, we, it would be useful to think about adding to the content model as we get get the case of fair zones for a city, which I mean, whose whose job is it to define those? Is it an individual operator or is it the city? Um, uh, so we do have fair zones in the NPTG for the plus plus zones, but maybe adding a capability to add um, fair zones as well as stop points to nap time would be a good a good idea. Yeah. Okay, um, it, it feels like that we could do with a separate session um, with with a few of the, the more interested parties and Giuseppe and his team. Um, so um, if, if we take that discussion offline, Giuseppe, and, and, and sort something out that, so we can have a, a couple of hours of focus on it, um, and, and, and yeah, more than happy to actually, I want to suggest um, whoever has a specific interest or knowledge in Napton, if they could get in touch with me, uh, I'll make sure that we're basically going to be kicking off an alpha development of, of the uh, new service uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, and let you all engage with uh, with our user researchers so that you know we, we have an overview of all your positions in this. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's me, by the way, guys. Uh, sorry for joining late. Um, I'm Corey Drury. I'm the user researcher working on the NAPTAN project. So, uh, hopefully, oh, hi, Corey. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you make sure that um, um, Teresa and myself have got your uh, details, and we can. Uh, then we can push them out to people to get in contact, but uh, but we'll sort out a separate um, session in a in a couple of weeks um, with a you know sort of a, a PTIC remit to try and get a uh, as consensus industry view as we can. Um, while we're talking sorry. about Naptan, sorry, who was that? Sorry, I was just going to ask a very quick question before just said because I don't think Mira's on anymore. Um, Stuart's retiring and he's moving on to Pastures New. Do we have any idea who at DFT will pick up the Trans Exchange 2.4 support? Uh, sorry, my connection is really breaking now. Um, long story short, I, I think we, we, we will have to. Uh, <laughs> we have no plan in place at the moment, uh, but um, more than happy to, uh, to, to, to see how we can do that effectively. But okay. we, we are still in touch with Stuart anyway, so retiring or running away before we manage to uh, sort of grab his knowledge in sense. Okay, thanks, Giuseppe. Yeah, yeah. No, fair point. Um, okay, so um, while we're talking about Naptan, um, last year PTIC did a bit of work that um, identified that the most suitable um, field in Naptan for use on um, audio visual announcements on bus was the uh, short common name. Um, if you remember that, we had a bit of a working group um, and then discussed it over a few uh, meetings and seemed to, to settle on that. Um, we now need to um, come up with some rules about how that might be um, populated um, as automatically as possible. Um, and so um, I'd like to convene a um, small task and finish group to um, work through that and what some of those rules might be. Um, so if there are any volunteers, uh, if you drop me an email or give me a call, um, again, I'll sort something out um, in a couple of weeks' time. Um, the aim of that will be to to, to come to conclusions 
um, and to have a session with um, Mira and Robert Johnson, who leads accessibility um, work um, during August. Feels like the right sort of uh, time scales to be able to do that. Um, so um, yeah, if if you want to volunteer um, for that, then uh, then let me know. Okay, um, then um, Richard um, Mason from Transport for the North is still uh, with us. I see good. Um, Mira a couple of times referred to the work that um, Richard and Transport for the North are doing on their fares project. Um, and so, um, Richard, can you uh, give us an update on where you are with uh, that work, please? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, I was planning to do to, if that's okay, just give an update on where we are with our disruptions work, uh, open data hub and the fares. So, is that okay? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Right. Um, so I'll start with disruption. So that went live. Uh, our disruption messaging tool went live in the north early this year. So that was March uh, of 20. Um, so we've now had a uh, first set of LTAs uh, using the tool. So that's West Yorkshire uh, Transport for Greater Manchester and Mersey Travel. So they're now actively using the disruption messaging tool. Um, so which is really encouraging. We're working with Nexus. To hopefully get those live in the coming weeks and then South Yorkshire um, a bit um, sort of in the next couple of months. Um, so hopefully by the end of summer we'll have the big five combined authorities uh, using the tool which is which is great. Um, so far we've had hundreds of messages that have been entered into the tool um, so that covers bus and tram planned and unplanned uh, disruption messages. I think there's currently about 50 uh, live messages in the system. Um, so that's uh, that's really encouraging. Um, so obviously that data is being published via our Open Data Hub. Um, so that went live in March uh, this year as well. Um, so we've seen um, numerous developers uh, access the Open Data Hub uh, and starting to access the Sirius X data that's been surfaced from the disruption tool. Um, so integration has commenced. Uh, so we've seen successful integration by MoveIt. Uh, and also bus times and we're working with the developer community to understand who else has um, got plans to use the data as well um, so that's all positive um, I believe that in terms of data publishing methods there's a request and response uh, method there and also a subscription API which has more recently been added uh, we are seeking feedback um, on the Sirius X and the methods that we're sort of uh, publishing that data from industry and data consumers and I guess the ask of PTIC we're there I guess we're encouraging um, people to access the open data hub and provide provide that feedback uh, in terms of um, fares so the last time we spoke I'm not quite sure when that was but the fares data build tool passed its GDS service assessment for the alpha stage uh, that again was in March uh, 20 uh, I believe that was the first um, GDS service assessment that was conducted virtually so we, we have that uh, have that uh, claim to fame. Um, it's quite an interesting session, so to speak. It's quite engaging, and obviously doing that over um, video conferencing is quite interesting. Um, but so we met that. So we've now moved into the beta private phase. So that's well underway. Um, so I guess we're working towards the GDS service assessment for that beta private phase, which will be later in the year. Uh, current activities: um, we're doing lots of user research with data consumers. Uh, so that's including journey planner providers and academics so thank you there's a number of people on the call today that have been part of that so thank you very much um so there's a feature development so we're doing um i guess user interface design for the creation of single return and period tickets and we're currently working on um these sort of more uh, basic features around account management logging on and resetting password uh, functions um, I was hoping Steve Penn would still be on the call, but he just, he just dialed off. He was going to expand on some of those points. Um, I guess there is some challenges over the interpretation and application of NetEx, that what, which sort of Mira uh, and Nick have already alluded to. But I guess what we are doing is we're working with um, Nick and Mira and also Julie and the wider BODS tech team uh, to try and resolve some of these matters. 
Um, so I know there's lots of conversations taking place. Uh, we're regularly attending the Tech Tuesday sessions. And I know there's several project meetings um, that Steve Penn um, and, and others are having with, uh, with those people to try and resolve that. Um, I think we are, I believe we are, we have started to share some of the NetX test files with the DFT BODS team for feedback purposes. I think that's only been one or two files, but we have started to uh, share some of those early test files. We do want to share more of those files, but I guess we just want to get that early feedback um, from the DFT team uh, to start with before we start sharing that widely. And we do want to sort of keep PTIC involved in that process when, when, it's, uh, when it's the right time, but it's not quite the right time at the moment. Um, I guess as part of sharing those files, we see that as a real key part of warming up industry to really socialize NetEx as a data standard that's coming into play. Um, so that, that's we're keen to do, uh, keen to do that. Um, I guess any ask of PTIC really is around, um, we've, we're undertaking user research with uh, bus operators as well as data consumers. So I guess if, if there is any bus operators that people are aware of that would be interested in helping to shape um, and sort of develop the service that we're putting in, then we're willing to sort of have a conversation with them and get them involved in the user research. I think that is probably it as a narrative. I don't know if anyone's got any questions. Did I get that right, Jonathan? Oh, oh yes, yes, that's a that's a that's a good that's a good description. Yeah, yeah, no, that's all accurate. <laughs> yeah. We're uh, we're we're delivering the um, disruption messaging um, at the moment with Trapeze. So, um, yeah. Yeah, there's 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 a fair amount of, of of use of it. I mean, anybody who wants to access it, just sign up on the developer portal, and you can use a tool like Postman um, to consume um, the Sirius X and sort of inspect it and um, play play with it and look at look at what the messages look like. It's um, because it's um, a post rather than a GET API. You need you need Postman. You can't do it in a browser. But uh, it's not too difficult to do, and uh, if you wanted to look at it, it will give you a, an idea of what integrations are available based on that on that on that data, um, which is being pumped out very regularly by by the combined authorities. So yeah, thumbs up. And Jonathan, and just a quick quick question, if I may, about the um, the NetX files. I know that early on in the um, alpha, we had to prove as a, as a project because we work with TFN and DFT on this, that we could produce NetX and it was done manually. Have we got to the point now where it's being automatically created from data input or is it still a manually produced NetX? I believe there is data files coming out from the interfaces, yes, that's what I believe, but it's very early. I believe that it's not a fully compliant NetX file. I believe it's just we're having to do some adjustments, manual adjustments to it. Um, yes. So, uh, so yeah. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, any more questions for Richard? No, okay, thank you for that, Richard. Um, uh, sorry, uh, it sounds like, sorry, it's Corey, uh, the user research from DFC. It sounds like there might actually be some overlap with the kind of stuff, with the kind of questions that we're asking and maybe the groups that we're speaking to. Um, might be an idea to schedule a chat at some point so that we can share what we're learning. Yep, that's, that's fine, Corey, yeah. Um, Yep. Um, I mean, Mira, Mira and I th maybe Giuseppe's got my de contact details anyway. So, yeah, just uh, reach out. That's absolutely fine. We'll have a conversation. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Okay. That, thank you, Richard. Um, so, um, we've been talking an awful lot about standards, particularly NetEx um, today, and the fact that it's, that it's new um we've got um an update on um where quite a number of international standards are there's been quite a lot of of change and new work being done um within sen the uh, the european standards um uh, organization uh, for public transport standards um so there's some new standards that Actually, since writing um, this update, um, 
10 days ago. Um, the um, data communications on vehicle um, parts 9, 10 and 11 that were, when I wrote it, waiting formal publication, they're now available from BSI in the UK. Um, they were published um, late last week. Um, Nick is involved in updates to Transmodel again, which just had a low, some significant updates, um, as well as um, uh, NetEx having um, the formal publication of, uh, of of some of the different parts. Um, yeah, the, so, so Tim, the, the other um, new. Uh, announcement that's just been in, uh, recently is that there's a new piece of work uh, that w is being done to add to NetX support for sort of new modes, so things like um, bicycle sharing and and uh, so where you know where are the bicycle share points, where are the charging repair repair, um, repair points, and so on. Um, so there there ha has already been a transmodel sort of submodel for that developed, and so basically what we're doing is taking the transmodel submodel for that and turning it into NetX. We will be doing it with a very close eye to the, um, the GTBS, that's the Google Transit Bicycle Specification. Um, so the aim will be to be interoperable with that in, in the same way that you can, you know, convert timetable data to GTFS, we'd like to be able to convert and be sure that it's interoperable with that. But but we were but basically it covers the sort of fixed reference data that you need for providing new mode services. Yep. Yep. And that will need to presumably feed into uh, to 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 thinking about NATAN and, and where that might need to go and things like that because they're all access points to to different forms of of public transport that's right yeah that's a very good point tim is is it's you you can it will be done um so if we're thinking about the evolution of naptown it's sort of yet one more reason for at least convert trying to converge the content models so regardless of what the actual exchange formats are on, on the common uh, um, common standards yeah, um, the last bit that I'd quick point on that, um, Nick. Can I just come in and ask Nick? Um, is it um, the, the European standard? Is it um, if if opt that? Um, no, NAP no. This is this, uh, yeah. Sorry, for, well, as far as NAPTAN, um, if that's what you're asking about, yes, that's essentially if opt was sort of subsumed into Transmodel. Um, and with 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 some sort of revisions and improvements. Um, so um, the NAPTAN, so the so the if so if opt is sort of formally part of of um, I think it's Transmodel Part Three. Um, and what is the alignment? What's the state of alignment of NAPTAN with if opt and therefore Transmodel? Um, the Pretty well, at 100% um, uh, uh, aligned. I'm, I'm actually currently, as a sort of proof of concept at the moment, to, to trying working on a thing that will formally take a little adapt that will take some uh, NAPTAN and 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 uh, NPTG and uh, I put it in absolutely uh, correct um, uh, NetX. I mean, you can do it by hand at the moment. I've done it for all the UK, all the UK data as. As part as part of the um, fair, the work we did on fair profiles, it, you can find the uh, UK data sort of a static a static dump from it last year turned into NAPTAN data among the files. But it's 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 pretty straightforward to take um, NAPTAN data and turn it into uh, n uh, the NetX format. Um, but should um, maybe that's a point for Giuseppe to note that. Getting from pretty much aligned to totally aligned might also be an objective. Definitely not. Yes, I mean, I've been having chats with Mira about this uh, for the future as well. So definitely on the radar. Yeah, the way we should be thinking about it certainly is a sort of stage one for um, harmonizing going forward is it, is it should be possible to make um, NAPTAN data available 
in X, in NetX just as well as in the current NatPan format. So that would, would allow people who want to start using NetX uh, ahead of time using that. Um, and um, and you can do that ahead of moving to the um, fully enhanced um, NetX model. You can just make what data you have available in NetX. Yeah. Okay. Um, the the last bit on the paper that I want to pick up is the is the data for PT project. Um, which is at, at the end of it, um, and and this is a UITP project that's got for a project like this significant EU funding. I mean, it's loose change in the grand scheme of things, um, but it's big for uh, for public transport data standards um, as a project to help the adoption of uh, of a lot of these standards. Um, oh, sorry, somebody's just rung the doorbell. So that my dogs are going mad, um, <laughs> um, and uh, and there'll be more about this as we go forward. But the DFT and Travel Line, um, and Nick, and um, to an extent myself, are involved in that. But it'll help produce a lot of training material and support material uh, to help adoption um, as we as we move forward. Um, so. Um, and, by the end of the year, we should start to see the first sort of stuff coming out of that, which would be very useful. Yeah, I know throwing the point that it, um, if there are suppliers or software um, de developers in the virtual room who are interested, it'd be worth getting involved and engaged with that because the, um, the, there will be. Um, opportunities for support and for You've broken giving up, support um, and, and you know, finding and helping customers and helping customers with that. So, so building, having a presence in that community will be Nick, we lost the last couple of minutes of that. You you broke up. Oh, so, sorry. Shall I? I'll just, I was just saying to suppliers and um, the software developers that the sort of community that the um, European Community Money is trying to foster, um, I think, would we'll be representing a, a useful place to engage with from your own point of view of both developing skills, picking up knowledge and also finding customers and giving support and, and uh, um, uh, build your, your own um, customer base. So um, I, I would, I would um, encourage you to get in, involved in that and if you, if you want um, and we, could, we can put your names forward as um, UK um, data transport experts if you're interested in it. I would agree. It's, uh, it promises to be quite an interesting uh, project. Tim, could you just um, uh, say the name of it again? I missed the first part of it. Was this the opera thing or is this something else? No, this is the data for PT. Ah, uh, OK, sorry. Thank you. Okay. So it's, it's sponsored by the, the UITP are leading it, and there's an organization called Data for, for PT is providing a lot of the um, support, and they're recruiting sort of experts across Europe to, um, to provide input um, for it. Great, right, okay. And is the this is presumably Arctic's involvement, is it, Tim, or is it not organizationally? Is it just individually um, from the PT connection side? Uh, Travel Line are involved. Um, they've got a, a observer status along with the DFT, um, and Nick's involved as a as a subject matter expert, um, and uh, I'm involved stroke Artig on the periphery because of uh, involvement in in some of the the, the sub working groups. Okay, great. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, any questions about standards and any other things on the paper? Might uh, just be worth noting on NetEx that uh, Nick and I wrote um, a proposal for DFT last this time last year as to what we would like to see happen as the end of the project with NetEx next, and um, Mira's just put that back on the table in the last couple of weeks. So we will be picking back up that document and making recommendations to the DFT about what needs to happen next, um, such as um, trying to work out what some of these ambiguities are. Now that we can see real data, can we iron some of them out? Can we make them clearer? Um, as Nick has advised, you know, there's quite often very soon after the first issue of standards and clarifications and tweaks to what's mandated. Some of them are policy decisions that DFT needs to make, but I think that needs to be, I think Mira has suggested that needs to be brought out of the document because it's not clear to them what they need to decide. Um, one of the examples is when you provide a zone, does it need to be just the stops in the zone, just the polygon or both? Because um, that's, a, that's a policy decision. So um, that's work that will be being picked up in the next few months, but at the speed that the DFT wants us to do it, I guess. But it's on its way. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, so um, next, um, PTIC website and um, branding. Um, so with Peter um, handing over the reins a, a couple of months ago, felt it was only fair um, that um, we did something about the the hosting of uh, of documents and uh, and some bits of of that only peter could do um and so um peter has a um more integrated website now um and um a bit of a new logo that picks up on the three sponsoring organizations colors um so um it'll probably last another 20 years um, <laughs> um but it does allow us to do things um like um spin up a page um on the on the bods um data with all the links to to, to where you can get access to the standards and things like that um because i was getting a number of questions um we did that and um Um, sorry, Peter. Suddenly, were you trying to say something, Peter? You're muted, Peter. You're muted. Am I muted now? Am I? I? All I wanted to say yeah. was that it was looking really good. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> it's great to see the progress. Good. Yeah. Um, one of the things that it allows us to do will be to, to put together things like uh, FAQs and have some um, more community curated content um, as we start to try and um, work out how to use things like NetX and new profiles for trans exchange and things like that. Um, so, uh, so hopefully we'll be able to uh, to make more use of, of that sort of online collaboration. Um, any questions, queries? No. Okay. Um, nobody's raised any new issues with standards or anything that we need to um, address here. Um, the the only There's outstanding issue. Possibly. Um, Oh, Tim. Jonathan, yes. One thing. Um, can you say something about the status of Siri.org.uk? Uh, Siri.org.uk is back in um, uh, UK hands um, and um, you should be able to um, use it to, uh, to validate things. <laughs> um, will, it, will it take a... Um... Uh, an FII request to find out how much it costs to buy it back from the um, squatter. Um, I'm not going to uh, to openly say, <laughs> um, but <laughs> we can have a private conversation if you want. <laughs> yeah, but it was so not just a reminder. A reminder to negotiate. <laughs> set it to auto auto um, update on, on the garden. 
<laughs> yes. Government included. Yeah, 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 yeah. For those that um, weren't aware, Siri.org.uk, which is the canonical domain for uh, for Siri and embedded in all of the um, XSDs for the standard, um, uh, became lost to uh, public transport. I think it's probably the the thing to say, um, and so uh, we had to, uh, to to recover it, but uh, but it's now back um, in public transport hands, uh, which is uh, good news and causing a few less problems for people across Europe. Um, it's scary how a single domain can can wreak havoc if uh, <laughs> if you lose it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, um, okay. Um, Issues, the only outstanding one that we've got um, is is a minor update to Siri to reflect um, um, fuel types. Um, that's working through the Siri working group and uh, and uh, all fall out at the end of the year with the uh, with the update to Siri that's being worked on. Um, nobody else has alerted me to anything that we need to be raising issues with with standards bodies and things. No. OK. Um, in which case, um, we would next meet um, in October normally um, in, in a wide forum like this. Um, by the sounds of it, there's at least two separate, um, more focused groups linked to that TAM um, to be held um, in between one on the uh, short common name and, and one on NAPTAM development more generally um do people think there's a need to meet sooner than october given it's easier to to meet in this sort of online forum i think i would like to see it a bit more frequently given that everything that pods requires is going to be mandated in the next six months so ABL by the 7th of January 21, NetEx by the 7th of January 21, and full trans exchange for every operator um, by December 20. So we're all impacted by that, um, local authorities, suppliers, consultants. So having an understanding of how that's going on. And from my personal perspective, unless we've got a start on the agenda for a supplier to pitch, I think we should make a decision about whether that's something that we do because we have such a small amount of time. Mm. I think when we've got more space and we're all in the same room, it's an interesting thing to have a supplier and somebody talking about what they're doing. But, you know, spending half an hour listening to something that's futuristic that we don't have time to talk about today is, for me, not been the most helpful part of the meeting. The rest of it's always been really useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. So what, early September. Or do you think before that, Julie? I, I, I'd like to see it before that, but I mean, I'm not the only person on this call. I mean, from a technical perspective, I, if we could do it, I mean, the new um, updated trans exchange is coming out um, in July. The new Siri profile is due out to all of us um, in a minute, um, whenever that is. Um, GDS is going to be passed for the next version of BOD. So we're all involved either as suppliers or data consumers of that system. And um, quite a lot of the stuff that Arctic's doing is also having an influence on that too. I mean, it might be worth just taking a poll after this, but my view would be as we get closer and closer to all these deadlines, it's probably more important than we talk than not, um, even if we, we'd only do an hour. Is there yeah. a date for the work? Is the working group planned? To, to, is there a new meet, meeting date for that, Jonathan or Julian? Um, do you know? No, no. So, Mira's, um, what's going to happen with the bus open data program board meetings and the implementation groups is they're going to be spread out more, so they'll be less frequent. Um, and the papers won't be issued in advance because the, the team has got other stuff that it needs to do. So there'll be um, the next one, I think, is in July for the Bus Open Data Programme Board and Implementation Group. I don't know. So they're changing the way that they do their um, stakeholder engagement. And in a way, that makes it even more important that we have this forum here to, to have those discussions to bring those points forward. Certainly the Operator Digital Initiative, which is kind of the operator side of this if you like um, they're meeting pretty much every two weeks at the moment because they're all trying to respond to this and give their views and take part and have one voice um, and understand it i mean at the moment we're all trying to understand exactly how it's all going to work across all three different data types so anything that we can learn i've learned a lot of things from this that i didn't know um, and i think you just don't know what other people don't know so any amount of sharing i think is really helpful as we all 
plan transition? Maybe end of July, Tim, early early August. Yeah. Obviously, it's holiday season. Yeah. See what we can do. Yeah, we're all going well, holiday. <laughs> it, 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 we've all been on holiday for six <laughs> months. Come on, yeah. now. You can still have a staycation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. having well, a staycation the, in the back garden. <laughs> the, the advantage of this forum is it, it's very easy to have it recorded and people can share, you know, can can catch up if, if they if they are on holiday um, or, or off doing something else. So, yeah, I'll pencil something in and get something in the diary for back end of July. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the other, the other idea, we talked about a focused nap time session. There could be, it would be useful because that's a different part of DFT that's running that to what's running VODs, and they, you know, they, they run their project separately. So having a, a, a focused VOD session where we can just try and understand what's going on with VODs might be a best way of doing it. But I do think it's worth asking the question a bit more broadly um, because a lot of people have got questions about how it's going to work, when it's going to work. Between us, we could probably answer, and, and particularly if Mira was on the call. Um, and that, the same goes for the developing standards and what's happening with um, capacity and service messaging, etc. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll have a quick word with uh, with Mira because she about availability of her her and her team because she feels quite important to to what's going on and being able to to answer things. So uh, yeah, but we'll aim for something back end of July. Okay. Um, is there any other business? I will take silence <laughs> as that's it then. So thank you all for uh, joining. Um, Teresa will uh, do her marvellous stuff with the minutes. Um, what I'm thinking of doing, Tim, actually, is given there's been a few comments about whether the recording will be available and stuff, is in, here's just a thought I've had when we've gone through this, is I might put some timings, um, of, if it does the timing thing, the recording, so people can actually go back and find bits and stuff like that, rather than wondering where the hell it was in, in the session. Um, so things like that we can do, perhaps to try and help chunk things down or, or, or kind of um, compartmentalise bits of it so people can get to it more easily. Good. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. And well done for the website, Tim. Sorry? Well done for the website. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and the logo. <laughs> <laughs> Logos are, uh, people love them or hate them, <laughs> whatever you do with it. <laughs> no, you've done it. Good. So, yeah. Okay. Um, if nobody else has got anything else then we'll close the meeting thank you all for coming and uh, see you all virtually um very soon, soon. thanks Tim. Okay. thanks everyone bye bye, bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Thank you.